Hello again, everyone. My name is Louis Ajurio. Welcome to episode two of a five-part series on Isaiah 53. This answering Rabbi Michael Skolbeck episode has been on my mind for quite some time. Since his arguments will be highlighted throughout, I want to make it clear from the very start that it is not my intention to insult him or Judaism in any way. I understand that his aim is to defend Judaism. It's what he believes in. I respect that. But it's not a matter of being right or being wrong. This is serious. This is a salvation issue. Before I begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite him or any other rabbi or counter missionary for that matter to respectfully publicly discuss any of the issues brought forth in this episode or any other episode for that matter. With that, let's begin with Rabbi Michael Skobach's first objection. The Messiah was supposed to be someone, as we learned, who would bring about a restored, redeemed, utopian world. For Jewish people who were living 2,000 years ago under a brutal and oppressive Roman uh, occupation, they were extremely uh, anxious to have the Messiah make an appearance. We know that throughout Jewish history, whenever Jews have gone through periods of extreme persecution, there was heightened messianic expectation and heightened messianic uh, speculation. And so we know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth was not the only one who claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, we have records of several other people back then who had the same uh, hope. And we saw that uh, just like the other people who hoped to be the messianic redeemer, Jesus met the same fate. Right? These are people that all died without fulfilling what the Bible very clearly described as the messianic uh, vision. Right? That this would be a human being who would be descendant of King David and King Solomon, who would be wise and righteous, and most importantly, who would rule as the king of the Jewish people at the time when the world has been transformed into a utopia. We saw that some of Jesus' followers were not capable psychologically, emotionally, of accepting that terrible news. They weren't able to accept the fact that this person they had pinned their hopes on failed to do what they had hoped he would do. And we saw that the initial response was to say that he will come back, that the idea that there'll be a second coming. They believed that Jesus would return in their lifetimes to bring about what the Messiah was supposed to do. And that was not a bad idea, actually. Uh, it's understandable, it's reasonable, but it didn't happen. And then we find about a generation after the death of Jesus, we have now a problem if you want to believe in him. Meaning that the initial response to the, to the disappointment was to say he'll come back soon to bring about all of the expected changes. But that didn't happen. So according to Rabbi Skolbeck, Jesus died without bringing in the Messianic Kingdom, therefore he failed. But did Jesus fail? Let's find out. According to Zechariah 9.9, it teaches that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And according to Daniel 7.13, it says that the Messiah would come with the clouds of heaven. In the second and third century, the rabbis realized that they had a problem. According to the Schottenstein edition Talmud, San Hedrin 98, this is what it says. Rabbi Alexandri said, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi noted a contradiction. On the one hand it is written, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a man came, as Daniel 7.13. But on the other hand it is written, a humble man, riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi resolved this contradiction as follows. If the Jews are deserving, the Messiah will arrive with the clouds of heaven. If they are not deserving, he will come as a humble man, riding on a donkey. There's one problem with resolving these two different descriptions of the advent of the Messiah in this manner. Let me explain. If the Messiah would come only once riding on a donkey, then Daniel's a false prophet. And if he comes only once with the clouds of heaven, then Zechariah is a false prophet. So by attempting to resolve these two different descriptions of the advent of the Messiah, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi is declaring that either Zechariah or Daniel is a false prophet. Or maybe, just maybe, both are true prophets and we have two comings of one Messiah, which is exactly 
what Christianity and the New Testament is teaching. Now let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's second objection. The two most obvious problems are that Isaiah says the servant will see his seed and he'll prolong his days. We'll see his seed in the Bible means he'll have children. Seed in the Bible doesn't mean, by the way, figurative children, like disciples or students. Seed is a word that only describes literal, physical issue. So it says the servant will see his seed. Jesus had no children. Here, Rabbi Skolbeck is making the case that since the word zero, according to him, can only be used with respect to biological seed or physical issue, and since Isaiah 53 verse 10 says that the suffering servant would see his seed, it means that since Jesus had no children, he can't be the subject of Isaiah 53. But let's see if that's true. Let's see if the word zero can be used in a spiritual or figurative sense. Here's one example, Isaiah 57 verse 4, a seed of falsehood. Malachi 2.15, a godly seed. Clearly that's not being used with respect to biological seed is being used in a spiritual sense. Isaiah 14, 20, a seed of evildoers, another place where it's being used figuratively. Isaiah 1, verse 4, a seed of evildoers, another place. And finally, Genesis 3, 15, where God told the serpent that he would put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between his seed and her seed. I don't think God was referring to little baby serpents here. Rabbi Skolbeck is also wrong on another front. The Hebrew word zera can be referring to disciples, and the proof is found in Psalm 22, a messianic psalm. This is what it says in verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melt, melted in the midst of my, of my bowels. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16, the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture, that happened to Yeshua. Verse 30, a seed zero shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he had done this. Clearly, here, the seed are the Messiah's disciples. And there are places outside of scripture where the rabbis use the word zero in a spiritual or figurative sense. One place is found in Genesis Rabbah 53, 12, written between the third and fifth century. This is what it says. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight, for in Isaac shall seed be called to thee. Rabbi Judin B. Shalom said, not Isaac, but in Isaac is written here. Rabbi Azariah said, in the name of Barhuta, the bet in denotes two, i.e., thy seed shall be called in him who recognizes the existence of two worlds, he shall inherit two worlds. Rabbi Judin B. Shalom said, it is written, remember his marvelous works that he had done, his signs and the judgments of his mouth. God says, I have given a sign whereby the true descendants of Abraham can be known. He who expressly recognizes God's judgments, thus, whoever believes in the two worlds shall be called thy seed, while he who rejects belief in the two worlds shall not be called thy seed. Clearly, the word zera is used here in a spiritual or figurative sense. Here's another place where seed, zera, refers to disciples. Genesis Rabbah 61 3 says this In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand. Rabbi Eleazar and Rabbi Joshua discussed this. Rabbi Eleazar said, If ye have sown in the early season, sow in the late season, for ye do not know which will be successful, whether the early sowing or the late sowing. As scripture continues, For thou knowest not which shall prosper, whether this or that, or whether they shall both be alike. Rabbi Joshua said, if a poor man comes to you in the morning, relieve him. If in the evening, relieve him too, because you do not know which of them the Holy One, blessed be he, has allotted to you, whether this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva discussed this. 
Rabbi Ishmael said, if you have studied Torah in your youth, study it in your old age, because you do not know which, will, which you will retain, whether this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Rabbi Akiva said, if you have raised disciples in your youth, raise disciples in your old age, because you do not know which the Holy One, blessed be he, has destined for you, whether this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Like the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. One final note I'd like to make regarding Rabbi Skobat's requirement that the servant in Isaiah 53 must have children. Sadia Gaon, a highly respected teacher within the rabbinic community, applied Isaiah chapter 53 to Jeremiah the prophet, yet God commanded Jeremiah never to marry or have children in Jeremiah 16 verse 2. Also, more recently, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, who passed away in 1994, many within the rabbinic community applied Isaiah 53 to him, yet he and his wife were unable to have children. Let's listen to Rabbi Skobach's next objection. And then Isaiah says this servant will prolong his days. Jesus died at the age of about 30. So Rabbi's third objection is that Jesus died at a young age, so he can't be the Messiah. Actually, the fact that Jesus died at a young age proves that he is the Messiah. Let's turn to some scripture. Psalm 89, 35 through 45 says this. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. The days of his youth has he shortened. Thou hast covered him with shame. Now this can't possibly be about David because David died an old man. Now look what it says in Psalm 61, 6 through 7. He shall abide before God forever. That's messianic. This clearly implies a resurrection. Look at the Targum in Psalm 21, 2 through 6. O Lord, in your strength the anointed king reigns, and in your deliverance how greatly he rejoices. You have given him the desire of his soul and have not withheld the expression of his lips. If you meet him with goodly blessings, you set a crown of pure gold upon his head. That's the Messiah. He asked of you everlasting life. You gave it him length of days forever and ever. His honor is great through your deliverance. Glory and splendor you bestow upon him. Rabbi, Rabbi Skobak, and to all the Jews that are listening to this video, Look what Rashi wrote regarding Psalm 21 too. May the king rejoice with your strength. Our rabbis interpret it as referring to the king Messiah, but the matter may correctly be interpreted as referring to David himself in order to refute the sectarians, that's the Christians, who became bold because of it. Now, I consider myself to be a very level-headed person. I don't like believing in conspiracies, but this whole thing reeks of conspiracy. It doesn't pass the smell test. Let's go back. The Targum on Psalm 21, 2 through 6, teaches that the Messiah asked of everlasting life, and God gave it to him, even length of days forever and ever. Rashi turns around and says that the matter may be correctly interpreted as referring to David himself in order to refute the sectarians. It's the Christians who became bold because of it. Can somebody ask Rabbi Skolbeck, If he believes that Psalm 21, 2 through 6 is about David or the Messiah, I encourage the Jews that are listening to this video to do their own homework. It seems to me that there's a cover up going on. Psalm 89, verses 35 through 45, teaches that the Messiah would die at a young age, yet he's being given eternal life clearly implying a resurrection, which is exactly what the New Testament teaches. Yet Rashi went out of his way to hide this fact from the Jewish people. So I'd like to ask Rabbi Skolbeck, what do you believe? Choice is up to you. Next, Rabbi Skolbeck's fourth objection. And we've learned already that any passage about the Messiah has certain telltale signs. They all, for example, speak about a king. And that's what allows us to say it's about 
the Messiah, because again, all messiahs were anointed. Were mes all, all kings were anointed. All kings were messiahs. So a, all of the messianic prophecies that we saw that were clearly messianic, and all Christians agreed with us that they're messianic prophecies, all speak about a king. Or they mention a descendant of David, who was the progenitor of the messiah. But there were always certain telltale signs that allowed us to say, oh yes, this passage is a messianic prophecy. Passage is about the Messiah. There's nothing in this chapter of Isaiah that has any of those textual clues. It's about the Messiah. So Rabbi Skolbeck makes the claim that there's nothing in Isaiah 53 to give us any indication that it's speaking about a king. That's his fourth objection. Well, let me give him something to think about. Isaiah 53 verse 1 speaks about the arm of the Lord. Look what it says in Isaiah 40, verse 10, that his arm shall rule for him. Don't kings rule? Zechariah 9, 9 says that the king comes into Jerusalem on the donkey having salvation. Isn't the reward salvation? Well, something to think about. Let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's Cinderella effect and his fifth objection. Problem number seven I call the Cinderella effect, or what Johnny Cochran said in his famous trial of, when he was defending O.J. Simpson, if the glove doesn't fit, you have to acquit. That the problem is that the Christian is insisting, the Christian is insisting that this chapter in Isaiah is speaking about Jesus. That's, the, that's what they insist. And the problem is that if that were the case, whatever Isaiah says about the servant would have to line up with what the New Testament says about Jesus, right? We say in Yiddish, they have to shtim, they have to fit together. And we're going to see, and we don't have time to do this tonight, we just don't have time, is that if we read Isaiah, we'll see that on many different accounts, it doesn't fit with what the Christian Bible says about Jesus. Let me just summarize it for you. And again, you have these sheets in front of you, you can learn them tonight when you go home. A few summary ideas. Number one, Isaiah clearly says that this servant is going to be despised and rejected. That the servant is despised and rejected. Let's think about two questions for now. How many times does the Bible say that the Messiah is going to be despised and rejected? Again, remember the idea of consistency. So Isaiah says here the servant is going to be despised and rejected. Christianity insists the servant is the Messiah. Well, how many times does the Bible say the Messiah is going to be despised and rejected? The answer is never. Except here, if this were talking about the Messiah. But that's the great weakness with insisting that this is about the Messiah, because there's no corroboration. The Bible doesn't have eight passages which all speak about the Messiah being despised and rejected. This would be it. And that would be one of the reasons to assume, well, maybe it's not speaking about the Messiah then. Well, once again, I am moved to disagree with Rabbi Skolbeck. He claims that there's nowhere else in Scripture that shows that the Messiah will be despised and rejected. Is his objection. Well, I disagree. Here are some examples. Micah 5.1, 414 in Jewish Bibles. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Zechariah 13.7, awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd. Here we see the Lord speaking about his shepherd as my shepherd, my fellow. Smite the shepherd. Strike the shepherd. That happened to Yeshua. And then there's Isaiah 49, verse 7. But saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. Who is that nation that abhors the Holy One of Israel? It has to be Israel, correct? Let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. We have another problem. In the Christian Bible, was Jesus despised and rejected? What does the Christian Bible say about Jesus? So if you look in your sheets here, just turn quickly to page 5. To page 5. Look at what Mark says. Mark says, Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from the Galilee followed him. Hearing all that he was doing, they came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, the region around Tyre and Sidon, 
He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowds, so they would not crush him. He had people following him great numbers all over the place. In Luke chapter 2, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. It doesn't say that as Jesus got older, more and more people hated him. It says the opposite. He increased in human and divine favor. In Luke chapter 4, then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to the Galilee and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. And he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised, not by a few people, it says he was praised by everyone. So when you go through the Christian Gospels, you will see that they describe Jesus as an immensely popular person. And the last week of his life, there were a bunch of Jews, supposedly, in a courtyard who rejected him. But Isaiah speaks about this as a servant who is not just has a, a few enemies for a few days of his life. Isaiah speaks about this servant as someone who by their whole being is despised and rejected. Their whole life is a, is a career of being despised and rejected. That clearly doesn't fit Jesus. Well, generally speaking, Jesus was quite popular. Outside of a few occasions, for example, in Matthew chapter 13, later in the chapter, Jesus went to his own country and they recognized him as the carpenter's son. And they didn't have any belief in what he had to say. Because of their unbelief, Jesus didn't perform many miracles. He didn't show them any miracles. But outside of that, maybe a few other occasions, Jesus was quite popular. But was he despised and rejected? That's the question. But Jesus wasn't only unpopular during the last few days of his life, as Rabbi Skobach claims. He was always having heated differences with the Jewish leadership. For example, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus called the Pharisees and Sadducees a generation of vipers. In Matthew 9, 34, the Pharisees said, he cast out devils through the prince of the devils. As you can see, they didn't like him very much. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 13 through 14, Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. The Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, Jesus healed a man that was blind and dumb. The Pharisees said that he healed by the prince of the devils. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus told the Pharisees that they were transgressing the commandment of God by their tradition. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. They asked them, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus called the Pharisees white as sepulchres and hypocrites. And Matthew 26, 59 says this, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. And John 19, 6 and 7 says, When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. They lied to Pilate. There's no such law. One final example in Matthew chapter 27, when Pilate gave the Jews a choice whether to save Barabbas or Jesus. It says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And they asked for Barabbas. Pilate asked, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And he was crucified. Now, since Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that the servant was not violent, let's listen to Rabbi Skobach's attempts to disqualify Jesus as the subject of the chapter, claiming that he was violent. Jesus unnecessarily kills an entire herd of swine, when in the Jewish Bible it's forbidden to cause unnecessary pain to animals. So this is Rabbi Skobach's argument. When Jesus was violent. He killed swine. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 8 and see if Jesus kills swine. Let's read it carefully. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. I'm reading it carefully here, and I don't see anywhere where Jesus killed those swine. Maybe I'm missing something. 
Let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. In the Gospels, it says that Jesus spied out the temple and he noticed things that were bothering him. And then he comes in the next day with a big whip and he whips the people, he chases them out. So this is the rabbi's argument. Jesus was violent. He actually whipped the people. Let's see if the New Testament bears that out. In Mark chapter 11, verse 15, it says this. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doubles. In John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, it says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. I don't see anything yet where Jesus whipped the people. And in Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, it says this, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus wasn't showing anger and he wasn't whipping the people. All he did was show a righteous indignation by saying, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. Jesus curses a fig tree. In the Jewish Bible, there's a prohibition against chopping down any fruit trees, even in a time of war when you could use it. But there's a story in the Christian Bible where Jesus approaches a, a city. He's hungry, it says. He sees a fig tree, and then he sees there was no fruit on the fig tree. What does he do? He doesn't bless it that it should produce figs. He curses it. He gets angry, and he curses the fig tree that no fruit should ever grow on it ever again, and the fig tree dried up, and it didn't ever produce any more fruit. That's doing violence to nature. So this is Rabbi Skolbeck's argument. Jesus was violent. He killed the tree. Well, I wouldn't exactly call this a game changer, but let's address it. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 19 through 21, it says this. And when Jesus saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now, what is the reference to the fig tree? In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel is likened to a fig tree. Here are merely a few examples. In Hosea chapter 9, verse 10, it says this, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first stripe in the fig tree. Jeremiah 8.13 says this, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. In Joel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, regarding Israel, it says this, For a nation is come up against my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he had the cheek teeth of a great lion he had laid waste he had laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree so what's the symbolism here symbolism is this jesus knew that the pharisees and the priesthood were going to reject him and because of that israel would bear no fruit that's the symbolism of cursing the fig tree keeping that in mind let's move on to rabbi skolbeck's 10th object it says in Isaiah that this servant would be a man of pain and acquainted with disease. Now, what does it mean a man of pain? 
Now, Christians are going to say, but wait, he was hanging on a cross for a few hours. Christians are going to say he felt tremendous pain. But the problem there is that it's a misreading of Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't say a man who experienced some pain because every person on the planet has experienced some pain. Pain. Everybody then would be a man of pain. Everyone had an appendicitis attack, a broken arm, something happened to them, a tooth bothered them, everyone had a stomach ache. Every person on the planet could tell you at some point in their life they went through a period of pain. But Isaiah doesn't say about this person he'll have some pain at some point in his life. Isaiah calls him a man of pain, meaning this is a, a being whose entire career is characterized. His whole life is a life of pain and suffering. There's no evidence that that was true about Jesus. So this is what the rabbi is saying. Jesus was on the cross for a few hours. No big deal. It's only for a few hours. So what? He was whipped mercilessly and beaten mercilessly and a crown of thorns was put on his head and he was nailed to a cross. Only for a little while. Everybody experiences some pain in their life. Some Sometimes you have a toothache, a tummy ache, or you stub your toe. But that's not the understanding of Jesus being a man of pains and well acquainted with disease. The whole concept is messianic. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 6 says this. Say to them that are of feeble heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Jesus healed lots of people. He was well acquainted with disease and pains. He healed lepers. He healed those with crooked limbs, those who were unable to walk, the deaf, the dumb, the blind. So I really don't see a problem here. So Rabbi, I think you take he took the verse in Isaiah chapter 53 totally out of context. Let's move on to your next objection. Problem number 11. If you go down to verse 11 here, it says, For the labor of his soul he shall see, he will be satisfied. With his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will cause many to be just. From a Christian point of view, what should this verse have said? Should it have said that with his knowledge, the servant will justify the world? Is that how Jesus made the world righteous? Is that how Jesus affected the world through his knowledge? From a Christian point of view, what it should have said was through his blood. From a Christian point of view, it had nothing to do with Jesus' knowledge. So this is the rabbi's objection. Where... Does it say that Jesus justifies many by his knowledge? Why do Christians believe that? Well, when you take a look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, it says this about the Messiah. And it shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. This is what it says about Israel. Isaiah 5.13 says, Therefore my people got into captivity because they have no knowledge. Hosea 4, 1 and 6 says this, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord had a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, knowledge, the whole concept of having knowledge means that a person knows the law and they observe the law. Jesus not only knew the law, but he observed it perfectly. And because he observed the law perfectly, he became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world when he offered himself as a sacrifice in substitute for our sins. That's what having knowledge means. It means not only knowing it in your head, but knowing it in your heart. Jesus did that perfectly. That's what having knowledge means in scripture. It has nothing to do with being smart or having a high IQ. Now let's move on to Rabbi's next objection. 
from a Christian point of view, the entire efficacy of Jesus' mission was that his blood was shed on behalf of the world. From a Christian point of view, we learned this last week, without the shedding of blood, the New Testament says, there can be no forgiveness. So from a Christian point of view, it was through his blood that Jesus helps make people just. Not through his knowledge. His knowledge had nothing to do with it. So we saw there were many, many reasons and the, and the blood had to be on the altar. That's what the Bible says very clearly. Sacrifices were only given with their blood on the altar to be a sacrifice. So Jesus' sacrifice was totally out of line with all of the biblical criteria of sacrifices. So the rabbi wants to know, where's the blood? How does the blood apply? That's his objection. Well, I don't think the rabbi's going to like this explanation. Let's take a look at what he, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. In John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus told Mary this, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. When Jesus left Mary, he ascended to heaven and offered himself at the altar in heaven. That's where his blood was placed, at the altar in heaven. And yes, according to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6, there is an altar in heaven. Let's move on to Rabbi's next objection. Problem number six. If you go back to this passage we just read, one thing that's missing, and it's a big problem from a Christian point of view, is that it says absolutely nothing in this chapter about the need to believe in this servant for his sacrifice to work. I mean, from a Christian point of view, the entire efficacy of Jesus being a sacrifice only works if you believe that he died for your sins. Nothing in this chapter speaks about people having to believe in him for the sacrifice to work. As a matter of fact, if you read the passage, what does it say? It seems on the passage to say the exact opposite, that we rejected him and we despised him, and yet he died for our sins. So there's nothing in this chapter which says in order for his death to be effective, you have to believe in it. Well, I'm really surprised that the rabbi said this. This was his objection. What does it say in Isaiah 53 that there is need to believe in the Messiah in order for the atonement to take place? Well, according to the Talmud in B. Barakat 34b and Sanhedrin 99a, it says this, that all the prophets prophesied only for the days of the Messiah. Jesus said in Luke 24, 44 and John 5, 39, that Moses, the sons and the prophet wrote of them. That would include Isaiah chapter 53. Take a look at Zechariah chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. But they, that's Israel, refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the form of prophets. That would include Isaiah. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. So what does this mean? 
This means that God gets angry with Israel when they don't listen to the prophets. And because they didn't listen to the prophets, they were scattered in 70 AD, and they've been scattered among the nations ever since. Now a word from Dr. Michael Brown. You know, when I came to faith in Jesus, Yeshua, I was just 16 years old. I knew very little Hebrew, very little of the Bible. Immediately, my dad asked me to talk to the local rabbi. He was a brilliant man. He introduced me to other rabbis. Before you know it, I'm talking to ultra-Orthodox rabbis that have been studying Hebrew all their lives, and I barely even know the alphabet. And they threw so many questions at me. I was determined, I just need to know the truth. As a Jew, I want to be obedient to God and honor God. If I'm wrong about this faith in Jesus thing, then I'll abandon it. And if I'm right, I don't care if the Jewish community rejects me. I have to be obedient to God as a Jew, as a son. But the more I studied, the more I dug, even got a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures at New York University and spent hundreds, probably thousands of hours interacting with counter missionaries and rabbis and other religious Jews and Jews who didn't believe. The more I studied, the clearer it was Jesus, Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. And what I wanted to do was be in a position to help you in your questions, your studies, your wondering. So we put together five volumes. I worked on these for years. Five volumes, each of them tackling different areas. Volume one of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus deals with general and historical objections. Volume two, theological objections. Volume three, Messianic prophecy objections. Volume four, objections based on the New Testament. Volume five, objections based on rabbinic tradition. You'll find comprehensive answers to so many questions that have come your way. And the more you study, the more you'll see Jesus, Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. When it comes to answering Jewish objections to Jesus, Dr. Michael Brown is probably in a class by himself. You can find his answering Jewish objections to Jesus series and other resource material on his website, www.askdrbrown.org. That's www.askdrbrown.org. Now let's listen to Rabbi Michael Skolbeck's 14th objection. We saw last week that the idea that the Messiah, the Redeemer, comes to remove sins from us was based upon a distortion by Paul. Paul distorted Isaiah in the book of Romans. We saw that in the book of Romans, when Paul tries to quote Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 25, about the Redeemer who comes either to or from Zion, Paul tries to quote Isaiah as saying, and this Redeemer will come to remove ungodliness from the Jewish people, to remove ungodliness from Jacob. And we saw that Isaiah never said that. Isaiah said that this Redeemer will come to those who on their own have turned away from sin. So the entire construct of a Messiah, a Redeemer, who comes in order to take away our sins, is based not upon what the Bible says, it's based upon a distortion of what the Bible says. It's based upon Paul's total distortion of misreading Isaiah. So this is Rabbi Skobach's argument. Does the Bible ever say that the Messiah will come to take away our sins? That's where it does. Here's one example. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. This is what it says. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, that's the Messiah, according to Zechariah 6, 12 and Jeremiah 23, verse 5. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Here's another example. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. One more verse. Zechariah 13, verse 9, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. 
they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Now for those of you who are looking for Isaiah 59 25, the rabbi meant verse 20. And all Paul was doing in Romans eleven twenty six was bringing in the requirement for repentance. Now let's move on to Rabbi Skobach's 15th objection. This is a very serious problem. If you go back to page 2 and you look in verse 5, what I've given you here is a more or less Jewish translation of Isaiah. But almost all Christian translations will be different. I'll give you an example. If you had the displeasure of seeing Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, I had to see it as an occupational hazard. The movie begins with a big blank screen. And on the screen is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. That's the whole beginning of the movie. Isaiah 53, verse 5, and the way he translates it there on the screen is like the way 100% of Christian translators will have it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's a mistranslation. So the entire Christian idea that Jesus is a substitute, that he's a sacrifice who dies for the sins of others, is based upon a mistranslation of the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the letter mem, to whom michulal mi pisha'enu, mem in Hebrew means from. So the better translation would be, as I have it here, but he was wounded not for our transgressions. He was wounded from our transgressions. He was crushed as a result from our iniquities. So this is what Rabbi Skobek is saying. He's saying that in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it should be better translated from our transgressions and from our iniquities rather than for our transgressions and for our iniquities. But that's not the case. Let's take a look and see what Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote regarding Isaiah 53, verse 5. No friend of Christianity, by the way. Now, he believed that in Isaiah 53, the Gentile kings are speaking about Israel. And this is how he understood verse 5. It was God who smote him Israel and afflicted him Israel because the sicknesses ought to have come upon us, the Gentiles. Habad.org translates verse 5 in this way. But he was pained because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The 1917 Jewish Publication Society translates verse 5 this way. But he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. And finally, the New Jewish Publication Society version translates verse 5 this way. But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. So once again, Rabbi Skobek's argument falls by the wayside. Let's move on to his next objection. And then we find about a generation after the death of Jesus, we have now a problem if you want to believe in him, meaning that the initial response to the, to the disappointment was to say he'll come back soon to bring about all of the expected changes, but that didn't happen. And so at this point, what happens is the whole idea of the Messiah is redefined to accommodate a dead Messiah, and that redefinition was the first step in the Christian movement, the Jesus movement, pulling away from Judaism. Once they redefined the idea of Messiah, we saw that everything else that basically changed within the teachings of Judaism was a result of that initial change. We saw that if you take a garment and you pull on a loose thread, the whole garment falls apart. So once you change one thing in Judaism, everything falls apart. So we saw that this led to for example, the idea that the Messiah is not just a human being, but early Christians became, came to believe that Jesus was God. Because if you insist, for example, as they began to teach, that no, the Messiah was supposed to die. He died to, as a sacrifice. He died for the sins of the world. And if you believe in him, all your sins can be forgiven. That's the Christian rewrite. That's the new concept that was developed. But the problem was, so what's special about Jesus? There were 100,000 Jews that were martyred by the Romans. 100,000 Jews crucified. So what's so special about his death? And so the idea came about that that's not just a human being that was killed. That's God's son, or the son of God. That they came to think of Jesus as God in the flesh, the idea of the Trinity, etc. What was so special about his death? What was so special about his death? Rabbi, 
Isaiah 53 isn't the only place that teaches about a suffering Messiah who would die and be resurrected. As I mentioned earlier, Psalm 89 is another. Verses 35 to 45 teaches that the Messiah would die at a young age. The days of his youth hast thou shortened. Thou hast covered him with shame. It's all about the Messiah. And the Targum of Psalm 21, 2 through 6 teaches that the Messiah asked for everlasting life and God gave it to him. What was so special about his death? He is risen. That was so special about his death. Do you know anybody else that that happened to? And in response to your allegation that Christians invented the concept that the Messiah is God is concerned, let's turn to Isaiah 52, verse 13. Are you aware that Isaiah 52, 13 teaches that the Messiah would be God? This is what it says. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted. Now, Isaiah 52, 13, the Targum Jonathan interprets it as of the Messiah, correct? And the Messiah shall be lifted up and very high. The exact wording that's used with respect to describing Yahweh in Isaiah 6, verse 1. Remembering this, describing the Messianic kingdom in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11 and 17 is what it says. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. Well, if Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day, and the Messiah shall be exalted, how do you square that circle? So as you can see, Isaiah clearly teaches in Isaiah 52, 13, that the Messiah would be God. The Messiah would be exalted. And according to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 17, Yahweh alone would be exalted. Now, let's move on to Rabbi Scoback's next objection. Is the word in Isaiah 53, verse 9, in the plural, deaths, or is it death? Let's see how he cites Isaiah 53, verse 9. And his grave was set with the wicked, and with his wealth, and, and the wealthy with his kinds of deaths. Although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Notice how Rabbi Scoback read Isaiah 53, verse 9. Is the word for death singular or plural? That's the question that needs to be asked. Well, actually, it is in the plural. That doesn't mean that a single person didn't die. That's because it's referring to a violent death, as if the servant would have died many deaths. According to Habad.org, this is how they translate Isaiah 53, verse 9. And he gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy with his kinds of death. According to Isaiah 53, verse 9, in the New JPS version, it says this, And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death, singular. An example of a single person dying and his death being described as deaths in the plural is given in Ezekiel 28, verses 8 and 10, to the prince of Tyrus. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Thou shalt die the deaths of this uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. Dr. Michael Brown gives the reason why the word deaths is in the plural. The reason why deaths is in the plural in verse 9 is because it is an intensive plural, referring here to a violent death. Such usage of intensive plurals is extremely common in Hebrew, it's recognized by even beginning students. So once again, Christians beware, counter missionaries use that argument that the word for deaths in Isaiah 53 verse nine is in the plural. And they'll claim that it's referring to many deaths, but that doesn't change the meaning of the passage at all. The reason why it's in the plural is because the servant would die an intense, violent death. Let's move on to Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. Let's listen carefully to Rabbi Skolbeck's reading of Isaiah 53, verse 8, and his explanation of the use of the Hebrew word lamo. From dominion and judgment he was taken away, and from his history who was able to relate? For he was cut out of the land of the living as a result of the transgression of my people, they were afflicted. If you go to verse 8, which will appear on the top of page 3, the next page, so I'm going to read to you what would be a normative Christian translation. But you'll see, again, it's a mistranslation. 
and it's a serious mistranslation. Here is a New American Standard Bible. He was cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. That would be a normal Christian way of reading this verse. Hold on for a moment. That's also a normal Jewish way of transmitting the verse. Let's take a look. Isaiah 53 verse 8 in the New American Standard Bible says this, For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom, as the to them, the stroke was due. And according to the Hebrew Study Bible, it says exactly the same thing. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom, as the to them again, the stroke was due. Also, if you take a look at the 1917 Jewish Publication Society version, it says this, For he was cut out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. And in the new Jewish Publication Society version, it says the same thing, For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. Let's continue with Rabbi Scobay. If we read the Hebrew translation here, from dominion and judgment he was taken away, and his history he was able to relate, for he was cut out of the land of the living as a result of the transgression of my people. They were afflicted. The Hebrew word here is lamo. Lamo, in Hebrew, as we'll see later tonight, means to them, or they. Well, even that translation doesn't help the counter-missionary effort. Let's take a look. As a result of the transgression of my people, they were afflicted. Let's think about this. What happened in 30 AD? The Jews shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And the Messiah was crucified. That was the transgression of my people. What happened 40 years later? The Romans came into Jerusalem, ransacked the city, destroyed the temple, killed hundreds of thousands of Jews, and they were certainly afflicted. Now let's move on to the next counter-missionary objection. He opened not his mouth. The counter-missionaries will claim that Jesus can't be the subject of Isaiah chapter 53 because in verse 7 it says that the servant opened not his mouth. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he shouted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So he certainly opened his mouth when he was on the cross. But that's not the context of Isaiah 53 verse 7. Let's take a look. In Mark chapter 15, verse 3, it says this, And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. He opened not his mouth. And in Matthew 27, verses 13 and 14, is what it says, Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word. He opened not his mouth. That's the context of Isaiah 53, verse 7. Now let's move on to the counter missionaries next objection was jesus willing did he have a choice let's listen to rabbi michael scoban if you look down just another two verses and the lord wished to crush him he made him ill if he would offer himself as a guilt offering he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days now it's not easy to translate this verse however what is clear from the hebrew is that this verse is contingent, meaning that it depends if this servant will accept his suffering, if this servant will make himself into a guilt offering, if this, however you translate it, it's clearly dependent upon the, the servant choosing to accept his suffering or choosing to accept this role. The problem from a Christian point of view is that Jesus had no choice. From a Christian point of view, Jesus was sent by God to suffer and die, and it wasn't as if he had any choice in the matter. Well, I'm glad Rabbi Skolbeck at least admits that the context of Isaiah 53 verse 10 is the servant being a guilt offering. It's hard to get any counter missionary to at least admit that. But let's see if Jesus had a choice. Was he willing? Well, sure he was willing. God commanded him to do what he had to do, and he did it. He didn't have to do it, he wasn't crazy about it, but he did it anyway. Just like any Jew would be commanded by God to do something, they would do it, 
He might not want to do it. He might not be crazy about it, but an obedient Jew would do it anyway. Let's take a look at a couple of texts in the New Testament. In John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, Jesus said this, Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. In John chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said this, Greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever, I command you. I don't see a problem here at all. Let's listen again to Rabbi Michael Skobat. So the first problem is that this passage is not clearly about the Messiah. I can try to prove to you it's not that clear. I just asserted it. Let me try to prove it to you. What the Christian basically is arguing, listen to this carefully, the Christian is basically arguing that anyone who really understands the true meaning of Isaiah, this is their assertion, anyone who understands the true meaning of Isaiah would understand from the Christian point of view that it's the most important prophecy in the Bible about the Messiah. Right? From a Christian point of view, this is not just any old messianic prophecy. From a Christian point of view, this is the prophecy. This is the most important one. So from a Christian point of view, what they would have us believe is that from the time of Isaiah and on, any normal person who would read this chapter in Isaiah, they would understand it, talking about the Messiah. Well, Rabbi, I hope you weren't trying to convince your audience that Isaiah 53 is the only place in Scripture that Christians rely on to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. I must admit, it's a major chapter, but there are other places. As mentioned earlier, Psalm 89, verses 35 to 45 proves that the Messiah would die at a young age. And Psalm 21, 2 through 6 shows that the Messiah would ask for everlasting life and God would raise him from the dead. There are other places as well. Isaiah chapter 7, the virgin birth prophecy. We have the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy found in Daniel chapter 9. I'll be doing episodes on the virgin birth and the 70 weeks of Daniel as well. You might want to be on the lookout for those. Then we have the prophecy found in Micah chapter 5, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Zechariah 9, 9, he would come lowly riding on a donkey. Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, he would be turned in for 30 pieces of silver. We have two comings of one Messiah. Zechariah 9, 9, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. We have Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Isaiah chapter 9, and that Jesus would be, the Messiah would be, a prophet like unto Moses, found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. So there are other places. I just wanted to comment on that, that's all. Now let's move on to the next objection. Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. How do Christians explain that? Isaiah 53 verse 9 says that he made his grave with the wicked, yet Jesus was buried in a place of honor, in a rich man's tomb. Well, here's the explanation. First of all, we need to understand that Jesus was tried as a criminal. He expected himself to be buried with criminals. I highly recommend this book, The Suffering Servant of Isaiah, according to Jewish interpreters by Samuel R. Driver and Adolf Neubauer. This is what Rashi wrote regarding Isaiah 53 verse 9. This was his interpretation. He gave himself over to whatever burial the wicked Gentiles might decree. And Nachmanides, another highly respected teacher of Judaism, lived about 900 years ago. This is what he wrote regarding Isaiah 53 verse 9. The prophet says, he will think in his heart that his grave will be with the wicked among the Gentiles, for he will say, they will assuredly kill me, and in this place will be my tomb. Does not refer to the grave in which he was actually buried but only the grave in which he expected to be buried. That applies to Yeshua perfectly. But there's more. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. This is how Rabbi Michael Skolbeck read that verse. And his grave was set with the wicked and with the wealthy with his kinds of deaths. Who's the wealthy? Well, here's the answer. The wealthy was none other than 
Joseph of Arimathea. He was the rich man who pled the body of Jesus. They took his body and buried him in the rich man's tomb. Now let's get back to Rabbi Michael Skolbeck. Another problem was that the Bible speaks very forcefully against the idea that a person who's innocent should suffer on behalf of someone that's guilty. The Bible says people have to pay and suffer and be punished for their own sins. People are not punished for someone else's sins. So this is Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. He claims nowhere does the Bible teach that someone innocent is punished or dies for another sins. I'm sure Rabbi Skolbeck is aware that this well-known dictum in Judaism that the death of the righteous atones is found in Moed Katan 28a and other places. Let's see how Rashi interpreted Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. Now we need to keep in mind here that Rashi was no friend of Christianity and he believed that in Isaiah chapter 53 the Gentile kings are speaking about Israel and that Israel is the suffering servant. This is how he interpreted Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Israel suffered in order that by his sufferings, atonement might be made for all other nations. The sickness which ought have fallen upon us was carried by him. We indeed thought that he had been hated of God, but it was not so. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of the peace was upon him. He was chastised in order that the whole world might have peace. So it appears that Rabbi Skolbeck has a difference of opinion with Rashi. Look what it says in the Zohar. As long as Israel dwelt in the Holy Land, the rituals and the sacrifices they performed in the temple removed all the diseases from the world. Now the Messiah removes them from the children of the world. Now that's a powerful statement. Imagine that. Here's another example. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Barakah 62b, it says this, The Lord said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough, said Rabbi Eleazar, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to the angel, Take from me the greatest man among them, who was capable of expiating many sins. At that moment, there died Abishai, son of Zeruiah, who alone was equal to the majority of the Sanhedrin. And lastly, Exodus Rabbah 35.4 says this, Moses said to God, Will not the time come when Israel shall need a tabernacle nor a temple? What will happen to them then? The divine reply was, I will then take one of their righteous men and retain him as a pledge on their behalf in order that I may pardon all their sins. Thus to it says in Lamentation 2.4, And he had slain all that were pleasant to the eye. So once again, as you can see, Rabbi Skolbeck's argument that Jesus can possibly be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 falls by the wayside. Now let's listen in as Rabbi Skolbeck uses the future sacrifices argument. And finally we saw that in the future, the Bible says we're going to have sacrifices in the future. The Christian idea that Jesus was a once and for all sacrifice and once Jesus died for the sins of the world, there's no more need for temple sacrifices. That just goes against the Bible which tells us many, many, many times that the temple is going to be rebuilt and we're going to have sacrifices. That's a very brief synopsis of how the idea that Jesus comes as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world is inconsistent with biblical teaching on the topic of atonement from sin. So Rabbi Skolbach's objection is that there will be sacrifices in the future. So here's the question. Why will there be future sacrifices? Let's go back to the beginning of Rabbi Skolbach's lecture, where he almost answers his own objection. Then we'll turn to scripture. We saw that basically the Bible's focus is in describing what the world will look like when the Messiah is here. That's the big circle A. And those are most of the verses in the Bible that talk about the times of the Messiah speak about not the Messiah, not the person, but what the world will look like. And it describes that all the Jewish people will be living in their homeland, that the Jewish people will have a temple built in Jerusalem, that all the Jewish people will be observant of God's Torah. So Rabbi Skolbeck recognizes the fact that during the Messianic era, Israel will be Torah observant. And that's true because the Bible teaches it. But why is that? Let's take a look. This is what God says regarding the children of Israel in Ezekiel 36 verses 24 through 28. For I will take you from among the heathen 
and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. The reason why Israel is being Torah observant is because God is causing them to be Torah observant. Now, this is what the Art Scroll Tanakh commentary on the book of Ezekiel says. This is what the Ramban says regarding Ezekiel 36, 26. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, God promises that the day will come when he will circumcise the hearts of Israel. The Ramban, the Snachmonides, explains this circumcision as follows. In Messianic times, the foreskin of the heart, which drives man to follow his physical cravings, will be excised and man's nature will be wholly good. Then the gift of freedom of choice between good and evil, which God granted man in order that he might earn his just reward will be removed. In the Ramban's view, this critical point of man's existence is described in our verse in Ezekiel 36, 26. The heart is man's nature. The spirit is his craving. Both of these will be entirely new and different from what they were in the past. The new heart and the new spirit will ensure that, by his very nature, man will want nothing but to walk in God's ways. Which is why, when God took Ezekiel up in a vision to see what would take place in the future temple, in Ezekiel 42.4, God told him to write everything down that he would see in that future temple. And in Ezekiel 42.48, there's no day of atonement. Reason being is that the Messiah who will be sitting in the temple, reigning in the temple, will be their perpetual day of atonement. The only possible explanation for these sacrifices taking place in the Ezekiel temple is that they are memorials. Now we're almost finished. Let's take a listen to Rabbi Skolbeck's next objection. The Christian concept of the Messiah is something that we learned a few weeks ago could not be confirmed empirically. It has to be le left to the realm of belief and faith. So there's no proof that Jesus is the person spoken about here. That's simply something that Christians accept on faith. They happen to believe that the person in this chapter who is supposed to die and atone for the sins of the world, they say it's Jesus. Is there any proof that this passage is pointing to him? Absolutely not. Again, from a Christian point of view, even if we wanted to take a Christian point of view, the most that could be extracted from this passage, the very most, is that the Messiah is supposed to come and suffer to atone for sins. That's the most you could get out of it. But you couldn't get one step further and say, and we know that Jesus is the one that suffered and atoned for the sins of the world. That's just an assertion they make. So here's Rabbi Skobat's question. How do we know that it was Jesus? Well, here's the question. Who else could it have been? According to a familiar Talmudic tradition, it reads as follows. The world will exist 6,000 years. 2,000 years of desolation from Adam to Abraham. 2,000 years of Torah from Abraham to the Messiah. And 2,000 years of the Messianic era. That's in San Jose 97a. The highly respected Jewish scholar, Abba Hillel Silver, stated this. About the second quarter of the first century CE, there was a great expectation among the Jewish people that the Messiah would come because the millennium, the Jewish year 4001, the fifth millennium, was at hand. But there's more. According to Daniel chapter 2, the Messiah would arrive during the days of the Fourth Empire. And he did. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. He came during the days of the Fourth Empire. Rome. According to Zechariah 9.9, he would come into Jerusalem lowly, riding on a donkey and having salvation, and he did. According to Daniel 9.24-27, the Messiah's advent would occur before the destruction of the Second Temple. And finally, in the Talmud, 
according to Megillah 3a, this is what it says. And Yonatan ben Yuzio also sought to reveal a translation of the writings, but a divine voice emerged and said to him, it is enough for you that you translated the prophets. The Gemara explains, what is the reason that he was denied permission to translate the writings? Because it has in it a revelation of the end when the Messiah will arrive. The end is foretold in a cryptic manner in the book of Daniel. And were the book of Daniel translated, the end would become manifestly revealed to all. Now that cryptic manner has to be the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy found in Daniel chapter nine. After all, what else could it be? Apparently, according to the Talmud, God didn't want Jonathan ben Uziel to interpret that passage because if he did, it would become clear to everyone when the Messiah would come. And the 26th and final objection that Rabbi Skolbeck makes is this. God hid the fact that the Messiah would die. This is what he said. So from a Christian point of view, what they would have us believe is that from the time of Isaiah and on, any normal person who would read this chapter in Isaiah, they would understand it, talking about the Messiah. Now I'd like you to turn for a moment to page 5. We're going to probably turn back to the page 2, but just turn to 5 for a second. And let's look at an interesting passage. In Matthew chapter 16, on the left-hand side on the top, we have a passage where, for the first time in the entire Christian Bible, Jesus had just asked his followers, Who do you think I am? You had 16 chapters in Matthew taking place, and this never came up. Who do you think I am? So, right before these verses that you have here, Jesus asks his followers, Who do you think I am? And Peter says, You're the Messiah. Peter says, Who are you? You're the Messiah. So now read on with me. From verse 21. So from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him and said, well, of course, you're the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Right? Wouldn't that be what Peter should have said? Duh. You're telling us that as the Messiah, you have to suffer and die? We know that. That's that's Messiah 101. Everyone knows Isaiah 53. So what Peter should have said after, you know, Jesus said, who am I? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, well, of course, you know, as the Messiah, I have to go and suffer and die. And Peter said, said of course, that's the main messianic prophecy in the Bible. But what does Peter say? It says that Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Wasn't, Peter wasn't aware of the fact that Messiah was supposed to die and suffer? Why is Peter so shocked? And when you go through the Christian Bible, this comes up many, many, many times where Jesus' followers are totally not aware of the fact that Isaiah 53 is speaking about the suffering of the Messiah. Well, Rabbi, here's the explanation. Back in the first century, Israel needed a Savior. The world needed a Savior. Israel's priesthood was corrupt. The Messiah's mission was twofold. Do you honestly think that the Jewish people would have killed their Messiah if they knew who he was? Messiah's first purpose would have never been able to be accomplished if they knew that he came to die for their sins. God hid it from them, as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified for blood of glory. Well, this presentation is concluded. In my next episode, I'll show why Israel cannot possibly be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Remember, believers in Jesus, you can make a difference. Spread the word and share this information with everyone willing to listen. My main objective here is to reach out and encourage our Jewish friends to do their own homework. These are important matters. It's all about salvation. My prayer is that you review everything contained herein, and you'll come to the understanding that as long as you listen to the counter-missionaries, you'll never get to know Yeshua, your Messiah. Till next time.